Hola, buenas noches a todos. Good evening. This is Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to tonight's session of En Casa con la Plaza. En Casa con la Plaza is our way of fulfilling La Plaza's mission of inspiring, honoring the past, inspiring the future, and recognizing the enduring cultural influence of Mexican, Mexican Americans, and all Latinos and Latinas in Los Angeles through our exhibitions, programming, and educational experiences. And tonight we have something that fulfills all. If you're on Zoom, welcome to all of you. Please let us know where you're Zooming in from. You have our, we have our Q&A capabilities there, ask questions. We may take them during the session, we may take them afterwards. Use the chat feature. Let us know where you're viewing from, please. We'd like to know. Facebook, live fans, the same with you. Use the comment section on our Facebook live feed to let us know where you're viewing from as well. Ask questions, make comments, we much appreciate it. If you're on Facebook also, start a watch party, share it with your friends, that'd be great. Well, we have a, a great panel with us tonight and I'm gonna hand it over, hand over the hosting duties to uh, my boss, uh, Mr. John Echeveste, CEO of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, who will, will in turn introduce the panelists and lead the dis tonight's discussion. So take it away, John. Uh, John, please unmute yourself. We are live. Okay, good. Uh, minor step there. Thank you. Thank you, Abelardo. And uh, good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. Have you with us tonight for this uh, uh, historic and timely discussion that we're going to have tonight. And uh, this discussion focuses on a current issue that uh, we spoke about, wrote about yesterday in the Los Angeles Times in uh, the opinion section of the Times. Um, and we're, we're here to follow up on that discussion tonight because we all believe that, that history matters and that history plays an important part in what our city is all about and in what we are all about as a people. And we have tonight with us uh, three very distinguished historians to talk about the city's history, uh, to talk about how the city history should be preserved and uh, happy to have them with you here tonight. So let me make the introductions and we'll, uh, we'll get into the program. Um, first is uh, Betty Ueda and Betty serves as a collections manager at the uh, Natural History Museum, uh, an exposition park. Betty, great to have you here. And uh, Betty is an expert, I think, from what I know of her so far, on um, street naming in Los Angeles. So uh, that'll be a very interesting dis uh, discussion. And uh, with Betty is her boss, uh, and that's uh, William Estrada, someone I've known since I've been at La Plaza for the last six years. And I like to say that, that uh, you know, nobody knows the uh, Pueblo Historic Monument District better than, than uh, William Estrada, you know. He knows the story behind every tree that was ever planted uh, in, in, uh, in El Pueblo uh, and everything else that goes with it. He wrote the definitive book on, uh, the, on El Pueblo called uh, the Los Angeles Plaza that is the primary source for the history of uh, the El Pueblo district. Uh, Bill also serves as curator and chair of the history department uh, for the Natural History Museum. Um, a distant uh, relative of ours as uh, we're both county museums. So Bill, thank you for being here tonight and good to see you. And uh, our last speaker, not our last speaker, but our last guest is Daryl Holter, uh, who I uh, just had the pleasure of meeting over the last few months. Daryl uh, wears a lot of hats. As you can see from his background, he's an accomplished uh, singer, and uh, recording star, artist, uh, been recording for a while, I think, Daryl. Uh, he's also the owner of Felix Chevrolet on Figueroa Street. And Felix Chevrolet is the oldest car dealership in Los Angeles. We all know Felix Chevrolet, the iconic signage. Um, you know, I grew up with Felix Chevrolet. We used to drive by it all the time. So we all know Felix. Uh, uh, Daryl was also the founder of uh, the Figueroa, Figueroa Corridor Business Improvement District. 
And like Bill, he's also an adjunct professor of history at USC. So good to have you all here tonight. Um, this issue that we're dealing with uh, uh, related to the renaming of Figueroa Street just came up within the last, last few months. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively um, recent occurrence. The city council is considering a proposal to rename a three mile section of Figueroa Street after uh, Kobe Bryant. Um, we all love Kobe. This is not about, uh, it's not about Kobe Bryant. It's really about preserving that history and the role of uh, uh, Governor Jose Figueroa. So to start, let's talk a little bit about Jose Fig Figueroa, who he was, uh, what his role was in governing California uh, back in the time. So, so Bill, if you could kick off that discussion and just fill us in a little bit about who he was. Sure, thank you. Um, Jose Segundino Figueroa Iparra, uh, better known as Jose Figueroa, was the sixth governor of California in, in the Mexican period. And, and how he, he became governor, how he arrived in, in Alta California was through uh, uh, an amazing military career. Uh, Jose Figueroa was one of the heroes in the Mexican War for Independence uh, from Spain. Uh, he, he served under the two great heroes of the, of the Mexican War for Independence, Jose Maria Morelos in the South, and he served under uh, Vicente Guerrero, who became the, the first, uh, he became the, the second president of Mexico. He was an Afro-Mexicano or Afro-Mexican. And, and Jose Figueroa served valiantly under, under both generals. So uh, as, as a reward for his military service, which, which was just outstanding, uh, he was offered the uh, governorship of, of Alta California. And uh, he served briefly. Uh, uh, his, his term would have been longer, but, but uh, he, he didn't uh, live long as, as, a, as a governor. He, he served as governor from 1833 to 1835. But um, becoming governor in 1833 uh, happened at the, at the time when the California missions and the power of, of the Catholic Church through the Franciscan order was being broken up uh, by, by the uh, directive of the Mexican, uh, Mexican government. So Figueroa came to California with a very, very uh, big uh, plate uh, uh, of, of problems to solve. Uh, and one of them was uh, what to do with the former uh, mission lands. Uh, he was a, a, a mestizo uh, of, of uh, European, Spanish, and indigenous Mexican Indian origin. And he was very proud of his indigenous roots. And, and Figueroa um, uh, had a lot of uh, empathy for the plight of, of California's indigenous or mission Indians. And in, in his plan for the breakup of the missions, he, he had thought to uh, break up the missions and offer half of the mission properties throughout California to, to the uh, former mission Indians so they would become uh, uh, um, independently run uh, uh, indigenous towns or pueblos. Uh, and he actually laid out that plan in, in a, a, a very important document, his... Uh, his manifesto of, of the uh, Mexican Republic, it was titled uh, the Manifesto a la República uh, Mexicana. And it, this actually became the first book to be uh, printed and, and published in, in California. And we happen to have a copy of, of the original manifesto in the Seaver Center for Western History Research at the Natural History Museum. So we're, we're very proud of that document. And, and Betty is, is one, of, one of our superstar staffs who oversees that, that collection. So um, uh, Figueroa had a, uh, he had a vision for California's future. And, uh, and in that future, the, uh, the, the former mission uh, Indians or indigenous people of California were to have a place in that society and they were not going to be left landless or penniless in his plan. But, but unfortunately, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Figueroa became very ill towards the end of his, in, in, in the 1830s, 1834, 35, and he, he died 
uh, while, while still serving in office. So uh, unfortunately, his plan for the secularization of the missions and the distribution of mission properties um, was not carried out. In the end, the indigenous people of California, as most of us learn from our, our hopefully learn from our grade school education, the California Mission Indians were left penniless and, and uh, basically outcasts, social outcasts. And, and um, uh, the mission properties uh, grew into the great ranchos of the Mexican era of the 19th century. Bill, Bill gives a really good you know, summary of, of Figueroa. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting about this was that so, so many of us, even, even someone like me who was involved in organizing the Figueroa Corridor 20 years ago, uh, never really knew about the history. And, and, and Bill, thanks for filling, filling us in on that. And, and actually, it's only one of the good things that comes out of this is that we're learning more about it. And mm -hmm. when I've talked to my own, my own employees, many of whom are, are a Mexican-American background, and I would ask them, you know, well, who is Jose Figueroa? And they wouldn't know. And then I would say, well, who is George Washington? And they would say, well, he was the first president. And I said, well, what was he before that? Well, he was a general that led in the War of Independence. And I said, well, there's Jose Figueroa. Kind of played the same role and we didn't know about him. You know, and I Darryl, think what, I, uh, one, one thing I might add is, is historians widely have, have credited Figueroa as being the most able and the most competent governor of the Mexican era. He, he really uh, was quite an administrator and, and it's un unfortunate that he had a, a short administration, but his vision for Alta California uh, was really quite remarkable. And this, this vision that he had in, in the manifesto is so important today for people to know about. I mean, this was a vision, it didn't, it didn't take place but he argued for it very persuasively in the manifesto. And one of the things about Figueroa was that he spent time with the Native, Native Americans. He spent time with the Franciscans to learn about it. And he understood the value of what, how they contributed to all the wealth really of California was pr produced in, in, in the missions. So that issue of the vision, vision uh, and, and that is really important. Mm -hmm. And at that time, at that time, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the capital of the territory was in Monterey, right, in Northern California. Yep. And Figueroa, uh, as governor, traveled throughout the mission system. I forgot, I knew this in eighth grade, how many missions there were in, uh, in the state at that time? 21. I was going to say 21. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and uh, so he, he could have changed the whole course of the state. We could look very different right now then if that manifesto had been fully enacted. And of course, there were others who wanted to get their hands on that land too, right? Very, very valuable property. And there was an insurrection, I believe, here in Los Angeles, right? To, uh, uh, to try to secure the lands that, that yes. he overcame. Yes, that, and, and he was successful in, in, in crushing that, that rebellion. Uh, mm -hmm. These were colonists that, that were sent from Mexico to basically um, uh, colonize and control California, and and uh, uh, and also part of that plan was depose was to depose Figueroa as governor, but uh, with the support of of the local population, uh, that rebellion was 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 crushed, and and Figueroa's. Uh, uh, claim to the governorship was was uh, was maintained. I, I I should also add that that you know F Figueroa was well known in Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, as governor, he he spent a lot of time here, and he had very close friends here. So much so that uh, um, uh, Figueroa served as best man for the wedding of Pio Pico and Maria Ignacia uh, Ignacia Alvarado here uh, here at the at the Plaza Church right next to La Plaza wow. de Cultura. And that was considered the most uh, important and the largest social event of the entire 19th century. So mm -hmm. it, it, it really uh, kind of puts a, 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 a mark on, on Figueroa's uh, presence here in Los Angeles. He was well known and, and well respected. Great, good. And of course, Pio Pico was the last Mexican governor of uh, California, of, of California. 
And the uh, Pico House uh, Hotel, which he built, still stands. That was built, uh, Bill, 1870, some a little later? Yeah, 1870. That, that was his last uh, uh, development project. Uh -huh. And, and uh, uh, it went through many, uh, he, he only held on to it for, for uh, 10 years and, uh, and then lost it in, 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 a, in a court battle. But the building is still here. And, and it was the first uh, three-story building in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And at the time, mm -hmm. it was the most elegant hotel, uh, you know, uh, south of San Francisco. But it, it, it is a monument to, to, to that era, that, that, that uh, time of the Californios. Right, yeah, my, my office looks directly into the Pico House. And I often think if those walls could speak, what stories uh, they could tell uh, about the history of, uh, of the city, you know? And it's interesting that um, we all drive, anyone who's lived in LA for any period of time has driven on Pico and Sepulveda and Alvarado and Figueroa, not knowing how those streets actually got their name. And they all represent, uh, uh, well, not, not Sepulveda, right? The governors uh, of the state, uh, of what was a territory of uh, Mexico at the time. And how, Betty, if you could talk, talk about how that happened, how did, how did those streets get named for the governors? Sure. Thank you so much, John, for inviting me tonight. Uh, you know, I've had a personal interest in the stories behind street names uh, for over 20 years. And when I joined the Natural History Museum 13 years ago at the Seaver Center, uh, working as an archivist, overseeing photographs and particularly maps in our collection, all these primary sources, and I found that they allowed me to um, to use these materials to uncover uh, many of those stories. Now, for all for us here tonight, you know, we in our respective museums, we all work there to strive to engage our visitors through exhibits, um, through artifacts, displaying artifacts. For example, John, you reminded me at La Plaza that you have a replica of the Ord survey, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the uh, map of the first American survey of Los Angeles that was done in 1849 by an army Lieutenant Edward uh, Ord. Um, and you also reminded me that uh, you have an interactive uh, exhibit called Calle Principal. And Calle Principal happens to be, you know, one of um, the streets that was first recorded um, on that, for record's sake, on that historic map, the Ord survey. <clears throat> and of course, Main Street is still with us today, as well as seven other original street names that were uh, first recorded on the Ord survey. Downtown, uh, we have uh, Calle de las Flores, um, Esperanza, uh, Loma, Epituna, uh, and then in present day uh, Chinatown, we still have Adobe Street, uh, Calle Calejo, and, and uh, Primavera, Spring Street. And so I like to think of streets like Echandia, Figueroa, Alvarado, Mitchell Torina, and Pico as open air artifacts. What I find very exciting about this set of streets is that they were intentionally um, designed, arranged on a map as early as 1855, actually, um, probably by a man named George Hansen, who served um, many times as city surveyor and also county surveyor. He was also um, credited with establishing um, the land out in Anaheim so that the German colonists from San Francisco could settle there for their vineyards. And so it's just amazing that, um, you know, this, the streets are arranged in the order that these governors from Alta California for Mexico for the times that they served, uh, starting from the east, Echandia, and then Figueroa. So 
each one was in the order of their time in, in office. And then the final governor, you know, is, is, is running east and west to be Pio Pico, of course. Um, so it's just amazing that they, they were in the order that they were. Now, I don't know if you can bring up a, the map. Um, Let's see if I can do that yeah. or not. What, what John is going to sh try to show is actually a map from the Seaver Center. And it's actually around 1870. And it's actually not credited with a creator, but um, a, a renowned uh, historian um, has assessed that it was probably George Hansen. Um, and yeah, sorry, Betty, that's not, oh, that's uh, not coming up. Yeah, so we'll go low tech. So that map, you know, I was hoping to show you the corner of Figueroa Jefferson. Now, the op-ed um, mentioned the date of 1857. Here's kind of a copy of the 1857 map that's actually at the LA City Archives. <laughs> and so this is really the extant item that shows um, you know, one of the earliest instances in which uh, Figueroa, as well as um, several of the governors show up on uh, a civic map. What's also really interesting about this set of streets and is the fact that it really uh, substantiates um, the tiny boundaries of the city, of the original uh, city which was a little bit over 17,000 acres. And so those, those streets of the governors land right in the, you know, the boundaries. And the boundaries are recorded on the Northwest corner is today's uh, Hoover and uh, Fountain Avenue. And then the Southwest corner happens to be where USC is and it's actually so that southwest cor corner uh, original boundary of Los Angeles is actually closer to Figueroa in exposition, ironically. And then the south um, east corner is in Boyle Heights, right at Indiana and Olympic. Um, and then the, the northeast corner is in Montecito Heights, where the Eugene Debs Regional Park is. So, you know, the combination of the city boundaries and then the fact that those original streets are there, um, you know, it, it really tells a profound story. And, and also, you know, these, the streets with the governors and also the presidents, um, you know, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, the fact that they were there um, about six years after the Ord survey. So these were the newest streets. Uh, following the Ord survey. And, you know, what was the impetus for naming of um, Figueroa Street and, and the other governors? You know, nobody really knows. Um, you know, I, I brought up the map of 1855. Now that date is interesting because in 1855, there was actually um, uh, English, the very first English translation of the manifesto um, that was published by the San Francisco Herald. And it's quite possible that uh, George Hansen, who was connected with San Francisco, probably had um, knowledge of the translation. Um, George Hansen was um, characterized as erudite, scholarly, and a philosopher. So, you know, I wouldn't put it past him that you know, he had a, a very um, thoughtful uh, intentions of these street namings. Um, you know, I also, since, since we're virtually at the plaza right now, I wanted to just recognize some of the nearby streets. Vignes Street, um, many of you know that street. Um, you know it so well, whereas nobody really knows Figueroa Street and the history behind it. Well, Vignes, of course, is for, you know, early Frenchmen who settled in Los Angeles and married a Californio. And, you know, he's remembered for his uh, successful vineyards. 
And so the street today is really a reminder of the early French settlers and also the agricultural, um, um, you know, endeavors of that time. Um, now, the neighboring street, which is less familiar, is Ramirez Street, right? It, it actually um, runs into Vignes. And if, if anybody ever goes to the Denny's restaurant there, I don't even know that Denny's restaurant is still open, but you would, have, you would have to take Ramirez Street to get there. So the Ramirez's, um, they were originally from Santa Barbara and then they settled in Los Angeles, maybe in the late 1820s, maybe early 1830s. And two of the sons, they were born maybe around 1839, um, maybe in one earlier than the other. Um, and those were Francisco Ramirez and his younger brother, Juan um, Resurrección Ramirez. Um, now they were both, those boys were uh, third generation Californios. Um, and Francisco is probably better known um, since he was uh, the editor of the first Spanish language newspaper and, you know, William, can elaborate on that. And that newspaper was El Comor Publico. Um, so, you know, you have all this history behind the street, Ramirez Street, which should be better. Um, thirdly, um, uh, the great grandfather of Francisco and uh, Juan Resurrección was Cornelio Avila. Now, if you, come to the Natural History Museum to the Becoming Los Angeles exhibit, the very first uh, artifact that you will come to is a crucifix in a case, of course. And that was actually the uh, crucifix that Cornelio Avila uh, carried during the Anza expedition in 1774. So Avila is, Avila Street is nearby and so the the Ramirez's were related to the Avilas. And so Avila Street is still there. You know, it's a sad street. It's behind the mini mall of uh, Bales Bonds home, houses. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. so. so. So, so it's so interesting that, that our street names can, can our, our street names tell our city history. Uh, these weren't random names that were just drawn out of a hat, uh, but they actually represent something. And just curious, Betty, if you know, because in that area, of course, is, is Hoover Street. Was that named later for the president or were they just looking ahead and uh, no. anticipating we'd have a President Hoover someday? No. Um, interestingly, in that area where... Um, Avila and Boche Street, right? Boche is right there by the county jail. Mm -hmm. um, very, uh, um, um, I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, Poor, okay. that, area, that area was actually residential. It was, it was lush with beautiful gardens. And one of the homes there um, you know, really close to the former Macy Street, which is now Cesar Chavez and Alameda, very close by there, there was a beautiful home of a person named, I think it's uh, pronounced Leonce Uber, H-U-B-E-R. And so um, he had a son who became, you know, a businessman and a capitalist and invested in real estate and I believe that it was his son who subdivided some of the lands and for some reason it ended up being Hoover instead of Uber. Ah, ah okay that's interesting okay good so so now we we fast forward to more contemporary times and Figueroa um, becomes one of the major thoroughfares of, uh, of the city um, and the place where uh, the first auto dealerships are formed. And Bill, that's where you come in. I know you weren't there at that time, but you know the, the history of the development of uh, Figueroa Street as a commercial center. 
Yes, uh, you were talking to me, John? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, thank you. So, um, so, so what happens, I mean, Figueroa, you know, it's it prime, you know, Grasshopper Street before it became Figueroa as, as we know from some of Betty's research. But, um, you know, when, when um, the automobile industry started around the, right at the turn of the century, uh, it started mostly on the East Coast, but then it came quickly to the West. And the first auto row in Los Angeles was on Main Street and it was mainly bicycle uh, people that made and repaired and sold bicycles and they evolved into becoming little automobile dealerships. And as the industry grew, they, they outgrew Main Street and they moved west where there was more space and they were grouped around Olive Street. So that, you know, in 1910, there were um, 70, 70 automobile dealerships selling 105 brands, primarily on, wow. on Olive Street. In, in, in relatively, you know, not really large spaces. But as the industry became more complicated and more people were driving cars, the, the, the retailers, the dealers who had started those needed even more space. And so they moved west further to Flower Street and Figueroa. Uh, and so you, you, see this, you see this very important development of Figueroa as becoming the, the, the major auto row of Los Angeles. To the point that in 1927, there were like 52 automobile dealerships uh, located, new and used, located on Figaro and Flower Street. And many of these are in large buildings that are still there. If you ever go to the Palm Restaurant uh, on 11th, it's a beautiful restaurant. Well, that was, a, that was an automobile dealership that was built in 1926. Many of the other buildings as you go down Figaro that are still there uh, are automobile dealerships. The Chrysler dealership, was a Pierce Aero dealership in 1915. And so it, it, it goes on and on. That was the auto row. By the time you get into the late 1930s, there begins to be a dispersion from the center of downtown. Uh, and there begin to be what, you know, we, we call now the suburbs and uh, shopping centers and automobile dealers um, in, in many cases were expanding. They were still downtown, they were still on Figueroa, but they were moving into other areas. And then when the Watts riots came, there was a, uh, after, the, after, those, after that period of time, there was an even greater dispersion away from, even from downtown, from the center and from the Figueroa as you go south on Figueroa. And uh, many, most of the dealerships started, started leaving. Um, Felix Chevrolet was originally in downtown on 11th and Olive. Uh, it moved, uh, it was started by Winslow Felix, Wenceslao uh, Felix. He anglicized his name. He was born in uh, at, at Tucson. He came to Los Angeles as about 17 year old, anglicized his name to become Winslow B. Felix and started selling cars. He became very successful. He was hired by um, General Motors as a rep for them. He became the owner of Felix Chevrolet in 1921. He started that dealership, built another dealership in the in early 1930s, uh, and became really well known as one of the most famous, uh, well known automobile dealerships, according to the LA Times, in California, partly because of his relationship with Felix the Cat, which was a relationship based on his friendship with. Pat Sullivan, who was the designer and owner of the rights of Felix the Cat. And they cross-marketed Felix Chevrolet and Felix the Cat. So Felix the Cat was used as a mascot for Felix Chevrolet and, uh, and uh, Winslow Felix sold all kinds of cars to all Pat Sullivan's friends. And it was a cross-marketing thing. So what happened is after the, after the Watts riots, the, the auto row began to decline and um, it, and also many of the suburbs like in Cerritos and Glendale and a lot of the others started offering automobile dealerships um, property tax release. They would, they would not have to pay property tax because they were raising all the sales tax and they would deduct the sales tax from the property tax. So a lot of dealers left to go to the suburbs for those economic reasons. And, and um, you know, when I came down, when I came down to help my father-in-law, Nick Shamus, after he, after he was diagnosed with cancer and after the Rodney King riots, 
And after really Figueroa was in really desperate shape at that time, it was mostly boarded up. It was in bad shape. And when I, when I came down, when I left UCLA to help my father-in-law to reorganize it, I saw how bad it was. And that's when I started to organize the property owners into the business improvement district. I started in 1997. And by 19, in, in March 21st of 1998, we formed the Figueroa Corridor. It took about a year and a half to organize 105 property owners. And what we did is we decided that we couldn't depend on the LAPD or the city. We couldn't depend on LAPD to keep it safe. We couldn't depend on the city to keep it clean. And we had to do it ourselves. So we raised our own money. We assessed ourselves tax. We started making it clean with our own clean and safe team. And you can still see them now when you go out in Figueroa 22 years later. And we made, them, we made the area clean and safe and it laid the groundwork for all the new investment. The Galen Center, the University Gateway, all the new mixed use projects on Figueroa, the Staples Center, LA Live, all of these things happened because the property owners on Figueroa figured out that they could organize themselves and make it clean and safe and bring back investment, which has resulted in you know, millions of dollars of, of uh, new investment and, and hundreds and hundreds of jobs. The idea here was to link up the economic power of downtown LA with the intellectual power of the university with the population of South Los Angeles. And that was really the, the, the vision that I had when we organized the improvement district. So that really has taken it up to this situation. The property owners have spent about over $30 million over the last 20 years to make Figueroa clean and safe and to brand it, brand it as Figueroa Corridor, a street named after such a famous person. So that's kind of you know, where we, we bring it up to the current uh, situation. Great. So, so Betty, just to go back to you for a second too now, Figueroa Street, is one of the longest streets in the city, right? It stretches close to uh, 30 miles, I believe. Right. And yeah, I thanks for bringing that up. I wanted to the public to know something really interesting about Figueroa Street. Now, imagine if you can get into your horse and carriage and you're down by um, Exposition Park at that time, it was Agricultural Park. And imagine you riding your horse and carriage uh, northward on Figueroa, and you might pass the future Felix Chevrolet on your way headed north. As you head north and as you get close to present or to uh, Pico Street, actually there's a fork right there. There's a fork on the road. If you veer slightly um, left, the left fork, you would actually continue on Figueroa Street. And this would have been before 1894. Um, that portion of Figueroa was, portions of that portion of Figueroa above Pico Street was vacated um, 1894 and another portion 1897. But if you took the other um, road and veered slightly um, right, you would actually continue on to Calle de las Chapulas or later Grasshopper Street or later is called Pearl Street. And so it what that portion to your right uh, above Pico was not renamed Figueroa or was not named Figueroa Street until 1897. And that's why the portion of Figueroa south of Pico down to Exposition Boulevard is just so important because that's, that's the most historic segment of Figueroa Street. Great, good. So, so Daryl, how then did this issue come up with, uh, with renaming Figueroa and how did you and, uh, and, and Bill for first hear about this? Well, John, it was a it was a real surprise to me. Um, you know, I as as someone that that organized and led the Figueroa Quarter for fourteen years, very few 
members of council or the mayors or anybody did very much down on Figueroa without coming and talking to the property owners and the and the businesses and the yeah. university and the rest of us. So we, you know, no matter what it was, we always kind of knew what was going on. They would come and talk to us and we would talk to them and we would work things out, including the $30 million street improvement project and many of the other things that were done to make it a, a better place. Um, we first learned about this from an article in the LA Times sports section. And we were very surprised that this was happening without, I say we, I mean the Figueroa Corridor and the, in our group. And so I, you know, when I heard that, uh, you know, Curran Price and I go way back, I've known him, you know, since before he was even in council when he worked, when he was in, in Inglewood. And of course I've known Herb Wesson for a long time and they were the, they, they were the people who introduced it. Um, I, you know, I was kind of taken aback and I put in a call to Curran like I've done many times before uh, and I didn't hear back for, you know, I called a couple more times, didn't hear back for like three weeks. And then he, he did call back and said that he wanted to talk to the members of the Figueroa Corridor. And he did through a Zoom meeting, say a, a few words. Um, but, you know, then I, we didn't hear, from, he said he wanted to talk about it, but we didn't hear from him again. And that kind of process has continued. He talked to me, he called me three weeks ago and said he wanted to meet with, with John. He wanted to talk with John and I about, about this. And, and I said, yeah, let's set it up. And he said he would, and his staff would, and they have it, and I followed up. So, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of disappointed because we've always had a good relationship. And, you know, I, I think that this is something that we have to put our foot down. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this is a street that's been named for important reasons. Even if a lot of people didn't know about it, that doesn't mean they're not important. And so that's really what we're trying to do. And I, I've got to say that working with Bill and working with Betty and working with John and working with all the other people that you brought around your, your organization has really helped. And I think that it's really been interesting to see how Mexican people from Mexican American backgrounds and Latino backgrounds have re reacted to this because they never really knew about it. And I'd like to see when we come out of this and I think we will win. And I think when we come out of it, I wanna make sure that on Figueroa Street, there are some commemorative markers of some historic sense mm -hmm. that indicate the importance of Jose Figueroa uh, and, and his vision for California. Good. So Bill, why, why is it important to you from a historical aspect to, to keep the name intact as it is? Well, um, if I can point to the beginning of the op-ed piece that appeared in the LA Times yesterday, and, and it really does encapsulate what a lot of us in the historical profession, uh, profession especially those of us who are LA-centered uh, scholars um, have thought about a lot. And, and it's this, is that um, it, can be it cannot be argued that Los Angeles has a very long history of erasing its past, especially, especially its built environment. We have seen so many uh, historic structures uh, uh, raised. And then years later, we lament that we wish that important building had not been knocked down. Uh, Los Angeles does have quite, quite a history of, of, uh, of destroying its, its historic past. Uh, so, so for me as a historian, you know, um, uh, you know, Figueroa Street is as important as, uh, some of our existing adobes, and there aren't very many, that really speak to uh, that past that, uh, that one, once was. Uh, so Los Angeles has, has lost a lot, of, a lot of its past. And, and I would say more, more than anything, uh, we've lost so much of the Mexican past. And, and some of that was very deliberate. You know, I've, I've, I've often said in, in a lot of my writings and, 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 uh, and public talks, is that during that period of the United States and Mexico War, the U.S. Army swept into California with a surveyor and the, and the cartographer, as well as the sword. 
they came in immediately to basically Americanize, change the landscape of Los Angeles. And, and uh, first, the political and, and economic power of the Californios were stripped. They, they were left landless. Um, and as Betty has, has already pointed out, uh, we see this process of Americanization happening almost immediately when California became the 31st state in, in, a, in, in, a, in 1850. Uh, Calle Principal became Main Street. Calle Primavera became Spring Street. Uh, and Calle Loma became Hill Street and so forth. And so uh, we've seen that, that, that past uh, erased, uh, erased over and built over, over, over the generations. And, and, and what's, what's really disheartening is to see that that, that, that process of erasure of of, uh, of of destroying our our cultural past. It happened well into the, into the twentieth century. I remember in in the early nineteen eighties, right before the nineteen eighty four Olympics, um, one of the most pristine two story adobes, the Lugo adobe in 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 the city of Bell Gardens, was was destroyed by uh, developers that hadn't been in Los Angeles for for too long, and they didn't care. And there was no outcry. There was no outcry at that time. Uh, so it's important that, that that we that we think about our past, and and uh, and and not rush to to make a decision. I I I respect what the councilman did, and in, 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 at least in trying to honor Kobe Bryant. Um, I I think they had good intentions, uh, and I and I believe they had good intentions. But I like I like to uh, marry good intentions with good research. Uh, had they done the research and talked to anyone? Uh, they would have found out that that this is a very important street, not just as a, an important street to drive down or or to do business, but historically, for Los Angeles and for all of California, it is it's a, it's a vastly historic and important street. Uh, so Los Angeles has has really destroyed a lot of its uh, historic past. We we have some recent success stories, uh, the Bree Street Show in Boyle Heights. And more recently, the the, uh, the Japanese hospital in Boyle's Heights on on Fickett Street have been designated as historic landmarks. Important important uh, structures that represent the the Jewish community of Boyle Heights, and and the Japanese and Japanese American community of Boyle Heights. They they have been um, uh, saved from the wrecking ball, and hopefully that will continue in, into the future. Uh, and and you know, let me say, you know, um, like like most people in LA. I'm a Laker fan. Uh, Elgin Baylor and Jerry West were probably some of my earliest boyhood heroes, sports heroes, and and certainly Kobe Bryant brought so much excitement to me and uh, uh, other Laker fans. Uh, but Jose Figueroa is deserving, and we are all as Angelinos of deserving or preserving our history. Uh, let's honor Kobe Bryant, um, but not by erasing history. Uh, and and I'd, I, I, I'd like to think that Kobe Bryant might, may have even felt that's not the way to go. Uh, there are other ways to honor uh, our, our recent heroes without forgetting the memory of, of our heroes of the past. And Jose Figueroa certainly is a hero for, for Los Angeles and California. And to that, and to that point, uh, Daryl, uh, the Figueroa bid has offered a compromise solution too. You want to talk about that? Yes, and 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 and. But I just like to just take a moment to thank Bill uh, William for that really great exposition about what we're talking about and why it's important. And you, you really you really nailed it, uh, uh, Bill. Uh, yes, I mean, what you know? What I've thought about it. You know, how do we, you know, look around LA, how do we honor the important people from our history? The way we do it, and there are many, many of these, is to have a, uh, a, 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 an, an intersection that becomes uh, a square. And, th and this would be, uh, you know, a, a square for, uh, for Kobe Bryant at 11th and Figueroa. Why not? That's the Staples Center. That's where we went and saw him. That's where he led so many, the Lakers to so many victories. That's where they had all their celebrations after they won. And 11th and Figueroa is a perfect place to have a square uh, for, uh, 
for Kobe Bryant. And I know this can be done because I, I worked on doing one with the city of LA and Jan Perry and the mayor mm -hmm. uh, on, on 4th and Main when I wrote my book on Woody Guthrie. And that was the 100 year anniversary of Guthrie's birth. And we declared that and that is now is, 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 is there's a sign that says that's what it is. I think we should do the same thing. So we've offered a compromise that really makes sense. We want to honor Kobe Bryant. That's that's good. We want to do that, but we don't want to, as Bill said, we don't want to erase our own history. So, um, the city um, has there been a response to that compromise? Has there been any any response at all? It's been very quiet. Uh -huh. um, the the hearings from this is this is this is in a, a committee that, uh, that deals with gang reduction uh, and public works and gang reduction. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a hearing on it, but the, the hearing didn't really take place. It hasn't been put on the calendar lately. I know from my own conversations with council members that I don't, I don't see you know, like a great groundswell for this proposal. Uh, and mm -hmm. I know people that have talked to the the proponents of it and have said, you know, you're walking on a landmine. You know, I would say that, it, you know, if, if the people that are listening in, that are watching us tonight, if they would take, take a look at the, uh, the op-ed piece that we wrote where we tried to crystallize the three of us, tried to crystal, and with Betty's involvement too, tried to crystallize the argument about why we want to preserve Figueroa and I think if we did that, and I think if we had a petition, a, a relatively simple position that put forward this compromise, and that if if all the all the people leading organizations that are watching and that are aware of the op-ed piece, if they send it to their members and ask them to sign a petition, and we created a position and we had hundreds of people that signed it, and I think it, I think we, we I think we could do something with that. You know, you know, why do things happen? Things happen because people make them happen. Figueroa tried to make things happen and we see, we see the accomplishments that he made and the vision that he had for the future. And it kind of depends on us. So, that, so, so the point is too, that, that we can continue to preserve our history while recognizing important figures of the current times at the same time, not in opposition to each other. Exactly, I mean, just, I mean, think about it this way. Betty talked about it. They interlaced the streets of Los Angeles with the governors of, of California, Mexican California, with the presidents of the United States. They interlaced them. You know, our, our histories are interrelated. They overlap with each other. Let's be proud of that. Mm -hmm. Let's not erase it. And I, and I think one of the, one of the answers um, uh, to our arguments is that, well, you know, we're not going to rename the entire 30 mile stretch of Figaro. We're just going to do a three mile section, you know? Where, where, how do you answer that? The three mile section, as Betty indicated, was the original naming of Figaro. And that is almost exactly what is being proposed to change to Kobe Bryant, which makes it even all the more, um, more of a problem. I mean, to take the original Figueroa Street and turn it into, and let the rest of it stay Figueroa, that seems like the wrong way to do it. And it doesn't at all conform to the, to the ideas that, that Bill indicated a little bit ago about how we need to preserve our history. I, I would say whether, it, whether or not it's three miles or the full 30 miles, it's disrespectful because Figueroa, the, the street was named for a reason. And, 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 and that's an important reason. I, I, would, I would love to suggest to, to politicians, to elected, public elected officials, is that whenever issues of historic preservation come up, um, best advice is not to make these decisions in a vacuum, not to make arbitrary decisions, is to talk to people. And if you don't have both people in your office, then go outside and talk to people because there are people out there who can educate you and share knowledge with you uh, like we've tried to do tonight. And, and in doing so, we don't make the mistakes of the past and Los Angeles can preserve its history. Uh, 
without continuing with this reputation as a city that has always destroyed its past. <clears throat> Good. Good point. And, and Betty, I know in recent years, of course, well, relatively recent years, there have been other instances where we've changed the names of, of streets. And I think, of course, of uh, Brooklyn Avenue in uh, East Los Angeles becoming uh, Cesar Chavez uh, Avenue. And I believe that's all within the county, not the city of LA. But is there, does the city or county have a process for, for determining that? Um, I don't know. I, I think that if someone uh, proposes and has a good reason to propose, then, you know, they're, then it, the ball is in motion. And I think with um, Cesar Chavez Avenue, that was on the part of uh, Supervisor Gloria Molina. Um, you know, there, there were, you know, arguments and, and, and debates on, on, on both sides. Um, so um, now I, I wanted to bring up uh, an example that I think was from 2018 and happens to be in San Francisco. Um, and um, the artist now, now I'm blanking out. Um, uh, I'm just blanking out. Diego Rivera's wife, help me out. Frida, Frida, Frida Kahlo. Frida Kahlo. She's yeah. practically a saint now. Right. <laughs> yeah, same for you. Right. So, a street for her. Right. A street was named for her 20, in 2018, a very small stretch along um, a, a campus of the city um, college in San Francisco, one of the campuses. And so it took over a street called Phelan, P H E L A N Street. He was a which mayor. Was named for um, a gold rush capitalist. However, uh, Phelan's son, was a well-known senator and uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Chinese, wow. and so, you know, it was it was a thoughtful and um, you know a welcomed uh, renaming in San Francisco. Well, you know, John, on this question of how it's done, uh, you know, there th the most recent example ha happened. Around and I'm blanking on the name of that famous commentator because I didn't grow up in L.A. for the Dodgers, but they named. Oh, right, right. That they, was they, 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 they named it. They named it a street. Well, just really like two blocks of a street for him. Uh, and but the way this went through, uh, you know, it went very, very quickly. It was introduced. Uh, there was literally no outreach, uh, and uh, you know, it, it kind of all already all happened. And in this case, when I asked about the process, when this first came to our attention, I was told by the staff from Current Prices uh, uh, Office, who was at a Figueroa quarter meeting, that, uh, the, the, that there would be outreach and that it would be done by the Bureau of Engineering, the BOE in the city of LA. Now, yeah. I don't know if you know about the BOE, but I do know about the BOE. And the BOE is the people who uh, handle very, kind of bureaucratic engineering things, okay? And what the BOE was gonna do for outreach was they were gonna calculate the cost of changing the signs from Figueroa to Kobe Bryant Boulevard. That was the outreach. Mm -hmm. That's how easy it can be done. Well, that's, that's yeah. another issue. Yeah, so at a minimum, we need to have a public hearing with some, with some opportunity for, uh, for public comment. And that was, uh, it used to be, I think, Scott, Scott Street or Scott Road uh, off of Sunset that became yeah. Vin Scully Boulevard. Vin Scully, right. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, I mean, we, we deal with this in a lot of cases. There was also recently a case in East LA, uh, Harrison Elementary School, named after one of the Harrison presidents. I don't remember which one. Uh, uh, the community wanted to rename uh, that for uh, someone who had more relevance to the community. And I uh, that didn't happen uh, with the school board. So it remains Harrison Elementary as well too. Um, so we're getting some comments from, uh, from our, our viewers here. Uh, Roosevelt Guzman says that uh, maybe we could develop commemorative murals on certain locations on Figueroa that could help augment the square proposal. And I think, yeah, once we move in that direction. There's a lot of different things that could be done there uh, to honor Kobe in that square. Um, 
Tony Valdez, our good friend Tony Valdez, formerly with uh, KTTV, hmm. said there's a small monument to the city boundary at Olympic and in Indiana in East LA. Oh. Have you ever seen that, Betty? Are you familiar with that, Bill? No. You've seen it? Thanks, thanks for letting That's me good. know that tip. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Abelardo, any other, uh, well, look, before we get to, to other questions, now, where, where do we go from here, would you say? Well, I, the, the first, I mean, I, I, really, I really want to talk to Curran Price. And, uh, and, and John, I, I want you and I and, and, and Bill and Betty, maybe we should all talk to him. Uh, I think that, the, I think that the, the momentum around this has slowed down. And I think it slowed down directly because we wrote that op-ed piece. It's out in the paper. I know, I know Curran read it right away in the morning. And uh, I, I, know, I know that he's aware of what we're doing. I think we need to, until we hear that the compromise works, I think we need to broaden the coalition. That's what coalitions are for. I mean, you have a, you have a great organization, John. I mean, your organization, I look at your, you know, the, the people, your board of directors, you have a great organization and you can outreach in, in, in a great way. And we can do it, you know, I can do it through my, uh, you know, methods too. But I think that, I mean, I just thought about the petition idea uh, as something that, that we can do. And I think we will win. It's yeah, uh, and, and we have we uh, have to acknowledge, of course, that it's it's a it's a it's not an easy battle. Kobe has legions of millions of fans out there, not only in LA but around the world. And when you tell them we want to name a street after him, of course they're going to to jump at that. Now Jose Figueroa doesn't have many fans other than the four of us here on this screen, perhaps, and a couple of other historians. So. Uh, and of course, uh, Figueroa was, I think, what, about five foot three. So he wasn't quite a match for Kobe physically two. either. Five foot two. Okay. Well, he, he was a giant in other ways. And, you there know, you it, 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 it should baffle right. anyone that a street that has been in operation under, under the, the Figueroa name for 163 years should merit some consideration when someone proposes to change the name. You know, that just shouldn't happen you know, with the stroke of a pen or, or a proposal. Uh, it, and again, it, it, it just baffles uh, the mind that, that something like this is even going through. And I, I would like to say that, um, you know, contemplation of our history continues. Um, next year in 2021, is that right, Bill? Is the 200th anniversary of Mexico's independence from Spain. Mm. It was 1821. And then, you know, that set into motion a lot of events with the um, uh, dismantling of the mission system and, you know, the incorporation of all these governors for which we have streets. So, you know, it's, it's and of course, uh, Jose Figueroa was integral to the Mexican independence. So this is next, his time. Yeah. Next, yes. Yes. 200th anniversary. It's a great point. Yeah, that's a good, very good point. Good point. We, we have a, a question here, Betty, too, which maybe you can answer. And that is, uh, is Sepulveda the longest street or, or is Figueroa? Do you I, know? Sepulveda is, might be the longest in the county. In the county, it, okay. Yeah, it runs through other cities. So I believe that Figueroa may be the lengthiest within the city boundaries. That's my guess. Okay, good. Uh, another comment that has come in from uh, Carlos Rojel, our friend at, uh, who runs, who was involved with uh, uh, co-run Spark in, uh, in uh, Venice, says that they've been working with local schools to build, uh, construct murals uh, that help help kids understand their past and their, and their history, um, especially around people like uh, Pio Pico and, and others. Uh, his question is, how can the efforts of researchers, historians, and public artists align to strengthen a public presence of these forgotten histories? That's something uh, I know you've all dealt with for a long, a long time. 
how do we how do we make these histories alive and vital and uh, get people to understand just how important they are to us? Well, I I may personally contact uh, the Natural History Museum's education department tomorrow uh, because um, you know we need to uh, you know bring up these ideas and um, because of the fact that it incorporates you know resources at the museum and you know we have constant collaborations and connections with our community uh, schools and other institutions in the community so you know we just need to start acting on it betty i wonder if you could just let people know about your blog on the history of street names in los angeles because at the museum it is the most viewed um online reference um, uh, it's it's an amazing site oh thanks for the plug bill i i think you <laughs> may be referring to uh the nhm's YouTube site, which has uh, my 2010 uh, homemade uh, video on the street names of Los Angeles. Uh, however, I do have a personal blog called Los Angeles Revisited, where I have, you know, I've done quite a bit on the history of street names throughout Los Angeles County. Thank you. Here. I'd like to answer that question about how, how can you how can you bring that it was a great question. How do you bring this to the to the people to get them so that they know about it? You know, I think the reason I think the way you do it is to involve them in it. And how do you involve them in it? You involve them in it by allowing finding a place for them to participate in it. So now they engage it themselves. It's part of them. For example, let me give you an example. I talked about a petition. What if we just for example, just think about it. What if, we, what if we organized a mass march down Figueroa, up and down Figueroa within that three mile stretch? What if we did that all with our masks on, social distancing, with signs indicating how we want to defend, defend our history? What if we did that? And what if I, I, what if I called up my low rider friends who drive around in, in, in Chevrolets that all have Felix Chevrolet license plates holders on them and what if they participate in the parade as well and we clap as they go by in those beautiful automobiles and the same with the vintage Chevrolet people they do the same too whenever they have a meeting they have all their cars have Felix Chevrolet license plate holders on them they're very devoted to this this is our history let's take it back if we give it to the people give it to the people and let them grab hold of it and take it they will take it and then they will understand the relationship between them and their history. Good. I'd like to also suggest that, that we we find some way to to uh, include this information, maybe a, a, about our great heroes of Los Angeles through street names, by getting it into our school system, where where uh, children who are at home right now can learn about Los Angeles by uh, through landmarks and street names and monuments. Uh, I think that's still that's still a work in progress, but that's 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 another way to get our younger generation to to understand and appreciate the the rich history that we have in Los Angeles, and let's work through the school district as well, and let's send that same information to our council members. Yes, right, right, right keep, away. Yeah. Keep keep our city history intact. You know, don't. Don't mess with it. It's 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 too fragile, and it's too important to be changed. Yeah. So so I want to thank you all. This has been a fascinating and and uh, informative uh, discussion, and also to thank you for the great work that you're uh, that you're doing in this subject. Uh, Abel, are there any other questions that have uh, come up or comments? Yeah, yes. Uh, Jorge Corralejo, a good friend of La Plata, uh, yeah. is asking. You know, how about new streets? In LA, uh, you know, naming them after people like uh, Bert Corona, Dolores Huerta, Mario Obledo. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm sure that's a question for another time. Uh, right here, Terrence Butcher is saying, I like the idea of dedicating a square to Bryant near Staples Center. Perhaps there's even room to place a small basketball court there mm -hmm. as well for public recreation with Kobe's mm -hmm. name attached or renaming the main court inside Staples, Kobe Bryant Hall. So, sure. 
there, there are options here, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. And we'd like to yeah. thank, first of all, our panelists. Thank you so much, William Estrada, also known as Bill Estrada, Daryl Holter, just meeting you today. And my gosh, what a, a lot of knowledge and, and passion you have. Uh, Betty, I've, I posted uh, uh, your, your blog spot, Los Angeles, revisited on the Zoom page and also on our Facebook page, uh, both uh, uh, on La Plaza's Facebook page, so we could share that out. Uh, John, great moderation as, as usual. Uh, thanks to the viewers that, that tuned in today. Uh, this was a last minute uh, in Casa con la Plaza section, session, which uh, just originated last Friday with uh, John letting us know that the, the op-ed piece uh, was going to be published yesterday. And uh, we posted the link on the Zoom and also on Facebook. So check it out and, uh, and keep in touch. This is a, a, an issue that, that will be uh, evolving uh, as the city evolves and um, worth considering and worth knowing more about. And we're here to, to pass that knowledge on. Uh, just if you came in late to the session, please you could, uh, or if you wanna view it again, uh, we'll be posting it on our web, on our YouTube site uh, at La Plaza LA, also on our website, lapca.org. And it'll also be, uh, it'll stay here on our Facebook page if you zoomed in, if you tuned in on our, on our Zoom page on our Facebook page. Uh, our upcoming sessions, this is uh, what we're doing these two, three, four times a week with a variety of presentations, uh, conversations such as this, demonstrations and performances. Uh, you could check out our, our schedule on our La Plaza uh, page at lapca.org, our complete session uh, um, event calendar is there. Our 100th session is taking place this uh this friday so tune in um we'd like to thank our sponsors a brand new sponsor pepsico along with our sponsors socal gas and california humanities any last words for any of our panelists please thanks for having us it was a great uh, opportunity thanks so much uh, bill and betty and john it's been really great working with you yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for having me on. And I just want to end by saying, Viva Jose Figueroa. <laughs> que viva. Okay. Que viva. Betty. Thank you very much. And, and for La Plaza, this is, uh, this is an important issue for us because, you know, we, we showcase our local history in our museum, but we also believe that we have an obligation to service somewhat of a guardian of our history as well, too and to protect our history outside of our four walls of our institution. Uh, so that's why, that's why this issue was uh, so important to us. And I thank uh, uh, William Estrada for, for bringing it to us and then introducing me to Daryl and later uh, Betty so that we could uh, all kind of coalesce around it. And we will keep you informed through social media on uh, uh, what is happening, what's transpiring with the issue and what actions we may need to take uh, to take next. Uh, next, nothing like irritating a group of historians. You don't want to miss with historians, right? I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. That's that correct. And, and, and historians know how to party too. I, we once hosted <laughs> the, the, the LA historians at La Plaza and they are the most fascinating people. That was right, just, yeah. I'm proud to be part of this, uh, this institution at La Plaza and proud to be a, a longtime Angelino. And thank you so much for all the work that you're doing to keep our history alive. So buenas noches a todos. Uh, good night, everybody. And, uh, and no, tune into the next uh, En Casa con la Plaza this uh, Wednesday uh, with uh, the great Dr. Gloria Arjona talking about soldaderas and her new uh, CD about the women revolutionaries of the Mexican revolution. It'll be, a, uh, she's a great entertainer, lecturer, and uh, it'll be a fascinating session on En Casa con la Plaza. Again, buenas noches Thank a you. todos. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.